What you would now get to experience is what is it like to actually have that high energy, to not have brain fog, to have a, a resistant GI tract that allows you to eat the foods that you want to eat, to be able to have a better metabolism for the foods that you're eating. The solutions mentioned in this episode are not a substitute for seeking medical advice. It is important to first communicate with your doctor regarding any of the information you wish to put into practice, especially for serious illnesses. Okay, let's get started. Colleen, it's great to have you back. Thank you so much for having me. Great to see you again. Yeah, good to see you again. All right, so uh, after that teaser, let's talk about this lesser known probiotic strain Clostridium butrisum. What the heck is that? <laughs> well, as you know, there are thousands and thousands of strains yet to be uncovered and identified and named. Um, but interestingly, this, this strain that we're going to talk about today, Clostridium butyricum, has actually been known and used in Asia for quite some time, for decades, um, for a variety of different GI issues. And it's only more recently that we started to really delve into its function and what it's doing and why it might be helping people with their gut health. And as you might imagine from the name Clostridium butyricum, it plays a role in butyrate production. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that, I think. Yeah. Now, before we go any farther, um, a lot of, my patients, when they see or hear clostridium, they immediately jump to the infamous clostridium difficile, or C. diff, which is a incredible mischief maker in people who have taken doses of antibiotics and literally is a life-threatening uh, colonization of the gut, which literally can give you, um, can cause your death. But we're not talking about that clostridium, right? We are definitely not talking about the clostridium that causes death. So yeah, within the clostridium family, there are different strains. Clostridium difficile, the infamous Clostridium difficile, actually many of us have it in our guts at very low levels, but um, when you take something like an antibiotic and all of a sudden this strain has no competition and it can start to propagate unchecked, it can cause a variety of problems. And part of the issue is that it's pathogenic. It has virulence factors encoded in its genome. So the Clostridium that we're talking about, Clostridium butyricum, doesn't have any of those pathogenetic or vir virulence factors encoded his DNA, so it's actually one of the good ones. Yeah, so so folks, there there are good clostridium. So don't uh, don't tune us off because you really need to know about about this guy. All right. So uh, I've written a lot about butyrate, about you know why butyrate so important. But you know, for everybody who's just kind of tuning in, what what is butyrate? What what does it do? Why do we need it? Well, butyrate is a really important small molecule that your gut microbiome generates. And so we all know a high fiber diet is really good for us. We're supposed to eat lots of fruits and vegetables. Um, and what happens after you eat those fruits and vegetables is that there is um, really no enzyme that your body encodes that allows you to digest them. There are microbes in your gut that help you to uh, digest these certain fibers. And when they digest those fibers, they convert them into butyrate. And butyrate is a very important small molecule that helps you reap the benefits of fiber. And so um, one of the kind of important things to know about the colon is that it is the only cell type in the entire body that uses butyrate as its source of energy rather than glucose. And so now you can see how important butyrate is in the role of the colon. Butyrate also plays a really important role in your gut barrier. And so this strain that we're going to talk about, Clostridium butyricum, that produces butyrate, is known to produce um, increased mucin, which helps you with your gut barrier and tighten up those tight junctions. And so butyrate is an extremely important molecule for the colon because it's an energy source. And it's also really important for your gut barrier because it's a source of production of mucin. So do we, let's suppose you and I eat a, a high fiber diet. Uh, does that mean that 
Clostridium just happens to show up on the scene and takes advantage of this? Or is this another uh, probiotic that begins to uh, dissipate, particularly in the Western diet? Yes, as, as you know, um, it's not just important to have the right bugs in your gut, but also to feed them the right prebiotics. And so if you are eating a high fiber diet, you're giving these strains the best chance at survival because you're feeding them. And then on a Western diet where you have less fiber in your diet, you're not giving them the food. And so many of us, you know, have Clostridium butyricum uh, and lose it over time. And so when you think about, you know, the idea that maybe you used to be, you can remember a time where you used to be able to eat whatever you wanted to and nothing ever upset your tummy and as you start to age all of a sudden it gets a little bit more sensitive you gotta watch what you eat when you travel you gotta watch what you're eating because you start to get some GI issues that you didn't used to have and one of the things that can happen to your microbiome over time is that you start to lose these strains which are really important for helping you with your GI maintenance and so um, that's why you start to experience more GI sensitivities as you age and so if you can get this strain back and you can feed it the prebiotics that it needs to survive, you can now start to have less GI distress compared to when you don't have the strain. I think that's a really important point. Uh, almost everybody remembers a time when they had a cast iron stomach and you know they, they could eat junk food and never gain an ounce and they never had GI upset and then let's just choose, I turned 40 and all of a sudden, you know, I, I'm packing on the pounds and I eat a piece of pizza and I'm miserable or, or I have, you know, diarrhea or, and I think your point is really well made. We now realize that a lot of times when we're young, uh, kind of before the days of antibiotics, we had a really wonderful diverse microbiome and now that microbiome is, is being decimated every day. But more importantly, your work and others have shown that these very important probiotics, uh, they taper off as we get older. And it really does explain why you know, we have issues as adults that we didn't have as kids. Absolutely. I mean, I grew up in Georgia and I was never afraid to stop by any barbecue shack and try anything on the menu. But as I got older, I started to really be careful what I was picking. I don't know. What's the craziest thing that you used to be able to eat that now you worry about? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, uh, I also uh, lived in Georgia for quite a while and I was a big fan of uh, Louisiana food, particularly hot peppers. And my brother, <laughs> my brother and I used to have competition of who could have you know, the biggest Scoville unit hot sauce, and it would never affect me. And then you know, as I age, holy cow, you know, one bite of a, of a habanero pepper, and you know, I was in the bathroom for a couple of days, and going, what the heck, you know, what happened? Uh, yeah, you're right. Exactly, exactly. Now you couldn't show your brother up anymore, so it's important to be able to do that by getting the right strains. <laughs> I, you know, I never thought of it that way. And boy, I, you know, now I'm going to go back, you know, armed with pendulum life That's and right. say, okay, come on, let, let's do it again. Uh, <laughs> exactly. No, I, I think that's very important. You know, in, in my first book, The Plant Paradox, I make a, a very strong argument that most of us, our gut microbiome is one of the major defense systems against the foods we eat, including lectin-containing foods. There's, there's actually a, a bug that enjoys eating gluten, believe it or not. And there are actually a number of societies, uh, particularly in the Philippines, that use uh, you know, gluten a, as a food product. Um, cetan, uh, cetan is you know, pure gluten and they don't have any issues, but that's because they've still got these bugs that say, hey, we love to eat that stuff, we'll detoxify it for you. But it's very interesting too, because you know, to that point, a lot of people will cut gluten out of their diet, and then they'll find that they've become even more gluten sensitive after that. And and it's because you're no longer feeding this to those certain microbes. So even if you started out a little bit depleted by not eating that food, you're really completely eradicating that strain. 
Yeah, they're they're just you know they're interested in you know things they want to eat, and <laughs> if if you starve them, uh, they literally we could say they either die off or they just decide to leave, and because there's because <laughs> there's nothing to eat. And yeah, I made that point in the plant paradox, and there is you know very strong evidence, particularly just stay on the subject that when people stop eating gluten, which is a good idea in a lot of people's cases, those gluten eating bugs that you know are gone and when they just get exposed to a little bit of gluten, it's like, holy mackerel, you know, what happened? Uh, I, I feel it immediately. Yeah, you're right. Do you think, you know, the, the whole science of the microbiome, uh, as you and I know, is, is so relatively new. I mean, 15 years ago, we didn't even know these guys existed. Um, and you're right, you know, there's, there's eight to 10,000 strains that are identified so far, and you, you probably, you're right, we're probably just scratching the surface um, of, of identifying and what each of these guys do. And also, you make a very good point, we've talked before, we now know that there is intrabacteria communication that one set of bacteria really need other bacteria and the things they do for them to actually you know accomplish what they're after can you can you spend a little time talking about that i mean how can one bacteria need another bacteria well, it, it's really a, a community. When you think about your community, there are different job functions that different people need in order to make sure that something works. So let's take, for example, uh, you know, God forbid your house catches on fire. You need firemen who ride in a truck that tap into the fire hydrant to pour water on your house to put the flames out. So it's not just the firemen that are important, it's also the people who build the fire trucks, and it's also the people who install the fire hydrants, and it's also people that maintain those fire hydrants, and it's the guy who builds the hose. So in that one thing where you just see a fireman putting out a fire, there are actually a lot of other things that are required to be functional for that to actually happen. And it's the same thing in your microbiome. While we may look at one strain and say, oh wow, look at acromancy or look at clostridium butyricum, such an important keystone strain. That's true. That fireman is a keystone part of this equation. But without these other strains that are in part of the ecosystem, that one strain actually cannot do its job functions. And so some of these other strains, what they do is they create small molecules that feed these strains. They create, um, you know, this ecosystem that allows them to thrive. And so I think it's really important that we note it is an ecosystem. And so you need all the parts of that community, even though we're highlighting these particular strains, those other strains are also important. All right, so let's get back to butyrate. Um, what, other than you know, feeding uh, colonic cells, which is absolutely true, uh, butyrate has a lot of other fascinating uses. And I, I spent a lot of time in Unlocking the Keto Code, my new book, really explaining uh, why uh, butyrate is so important for many issues. Can you, can you elaborate on, okay, it's feeding the colon cells, that's, that's a good idea. Uh, and it's true that people who have low butyrate levels has been associated with an increased risk of colon cancer. Um, and there's a lot of animal and human research to substantiate that. And that's a good thing to avoid, I would think. Uh, so what else can butyrate do for us? Well, I think in addition to making sure you have healthy colon cells and, and hopefully, uh, you know, avoid going down the path of colon cancer, um, butyrate, uh, as I um, was alluding to before, is very important for your gut barrier. And so when you think about the strength of your gut, it's really important to think about the lining of your gut and those tight junctions that keep that gut um, really as a true barrier for all of the small molecules being created inside of your body and all of the things that uh, inside of your gut, sorry, and all the things outside of your gut that really shouldn't touch each other. And then also for all the receptors 
that sit in the gut lining for them to be properly positioned and held in the place that they need to be held and so that they can serve as the right signaling molecules come along, the receptor can actually bind to those signaling molecules and then send signals outside of the gut. Butyrate is super important for helping to maintain that gut lining. And so it's known that if you're low in Clostridium butyricum, that you actually have um, less uh, mucin. So actually putting Clostridium butyricum back in can increase the mucin production, which is important for that gut lining. And some of the things that you might experience when you don't have the right mucin amount there, you don't have these good tight junctions there, are GI distress, sensitivity to foods that you didn't used to have sensitivities to. But even the immune and inflammatory responses are related to this because what those receptors are doing, the gut lining, is signaling into your body the right immune and inflammatory responses to have. So when you don't have the right receptors and you don't have the right butyrate that's there to bind to those receptors, and you don't have the right gut lining holding them in place and bringing them together, you can have miscommunication on the immune inflammatory responses. And Clostridium butyricum has been studied widely across the world in its role in both uh, regulation of both the immune and the inflammatory responses. And so um, we, the, this sort of underlying gut barrier is super important for a variety of different things that we experience. Yeah, you're, I think what you're saying is what Hippocrates said 2,500 years ago is that all disease <laughs> begins in the gut. And that's right. The guy was right. And, you know, I paraphrase that to say all disease begins with a leaky gut. And uh, yeah, and you're exactly right. The other thing that I mentioned in unlocking the keto code is that butyrate and other short chain fatty acids are uh, HDACI uh, inhibitors, uh, histone decarboxylase uh, inhibitors. And cancer cells use histone decarboxylate to uh, grow and divide, and butyrate suppresses that ability. So, you know, let's get some butyrate in us, for goodness sakes. Yeah, I think there's been a variety of new studies around different types of cancer, you know, beyond just colon cancer that are, uh, you know, butyrate is showing to play an important role in. And, and I'd like to maybe take a moment to make a point about butyrate itself, because there are a lot of butyrate supplements out there, and you can just simply buy butyrate off the shelves. And so I just think it's important to know the difference between buying and ingesting butyrate versus ingesting a, 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 a probiotic that is able to generate butyrate. And that has to do with localization. And so, you know, Dr. Gundry, if, if I said, I've got a million dollars for you, would you rather I brought it in a suitcase to your door and handed the suitcase to you with the million dollars in it? Or would you rather me let you know that I just scattered it in $1 bills all over Highway 101? And I'm sure you would rather have that suitcase delivered to you with all of the dollar bills inside of it. And that is the similarity of just taking butyrate, where if you just take butyrate, it's like scattering a bunch of dollar bills across the freeway. Every car is going to stop and they're going to take those dollar bills up before it ever makes it to your house. And so butyrate, because it is the primary source of energy for all the colon cells, when you just take that small molecule, it gets absorbed by all your colon cells, which is great for your colon cells, but doesn't actually get it to these receptors. In the the gut lining that are going to help give you these other benefits. So in, 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 in contrast to that, when you take the microbe that actually generates butyrate and you get that microbe into the GI tract where it's supposed to live and it's sitting in there generating butyrate right at the site of the gut lining, that's when you're actually going to get the so-called suitcase delivery right to that door, the receptor, so that you get the benefits uh, at the site you want it. No, I think that's a very, very important point. Um, there are lots of butyrate supplements out there. Uh, you're right. They really never get to where you want the action to become. And, uh, and, and since you're going to give me a million dollars, could you put it on my yacht in the Cayman Islands so that, you know, <laughs> and no, I don't have a yacht in the Cayman Islands. So. Uh, <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Yes. You just tell me where to put it. It's just that's like right. the butyrate. I mean, that's why it, there are so many great applications of butyrate that have been shown in preclinical models that haven't translated into humans. And I don't think it's because butyrate is not important. I think butyrate is very important. But I think what we haven't fully unlocked is how do we deliver butyrate properly? And the microbiome and the science that the, the industry is doing right now is going to be that unlock for butyrate. Well, so what, so what happens if your body 
doesn't have enough uh, butyrate? I know we're kind of danced around this question. I mean, should, so what? I, you know, I don't have any butyrate in me. So what? I'm fine. Yeah, I think that uh, you, you might feel like you're fine, but um, this is something in particular with aging that uh, you, you, you st all of us start to realize as we're aging that certain things are more sensitive or don't operate as well as they used to. And so it can span the gamut from having less energy to having more GI sensitivity to having, um, you know, lower, slower metabolism, all of these things that are happening to us. And we sort of shrug our shoulders and say, well, that's just something that young people get to have. And this is just part of aging. The truth is that the microbiome is a very important part to aging. And we know that over time and with stress, and even changing time zones where you get circadian rhythm changes. And for us women, when we go through menopause, all of these things are associated with a depletion of your microbiome. And so it might not be a lost cause yet because what might be happening is that you're just losing certain microbes that if you were able to get them back, what you would experience, which you haven't experienced in a while, what you would now get to experience is what is it like to actually have that high energy, to not have brain fog, to have a, a resistant GI tract that allows you to eat the foods that you want to eat, to be able to have a better metabolism for the foods that you're eating. And what we've observed with our customers is that many people are reliving a time that they didn't even know that that they could and they're they're having these experiences that they weren't even expecting and one of the most amazing things that I've uh, we, we've been hearing about is reduced sugar cravings and I think this is really interesting because you might notice that you have more and more of these cravings as you get older and there is this gut brain connection where your gut is giving your brain information that it has also to do with satiety and your cravings. And so by giving yourself the, these strains back, you have an opportunity to experience all of these improved things that till now, you know, science hasn't really known what to attribute them to. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, in the, um, in, in my last book, The Energy Paradox, I cite a, a fascinating Chinese study that they took volunteers and put them on a seven or a 14 day water fast. And one group got 100 calories of prebiotic fiber uh, per day and the other group didn't. And Prebiotic fiber we can't digest, like you mentioned, uh, but it feeds these good gut bacteria. And the fascinating thing is these folks on a seven to 14 day water fast who got the prebiotic fiber had no hunger. Whereas the other, the other group was pretty doggone hungry. And so you're right, there is, and I talk about this, you know, ad nauseum, there is this amazing control of our brain, of our emotions, of our hunger, by the products of these gut bacteria, the, the postbiotics. And it turns out butyrate is a postbiotic that our gut buddies, including Clostridium, make for us. Uh, all right, uh, most people, a lot of people know that butter uh, is named for butyrate, butyric acid. Shouldn't I just be having a couple sticks of butter a day, Colleen? Come on. <laughs> well, um, I, I, butter makes everything better. Certainly, <laughs> I can't say that you shouldn't eat any butter. It's, it's, it's just good, good tasting stuff. Um, I think if you want to really reap the benefits of butyrate, um, you have to have the right microbiome in order to do that. And it really does boil down to providing yourself with the right prebiotics that feed these bugs and then just seeding with the probiotics themselves. And so making sure that you are um, aware when you look at a label on a probiotic and you're looking for things that are butyrate producers and you're trying to consume the right prebiotics to feed those, it's all part of this, this system that works together. So, um, you know, I think uh, we are heading into a world where we're really going to be able to distinguish for you what are the right butyrate producers to ingest that are going to help, uh, that are going to seed in your microbiome, that are going to help you with issues? And, and this is sort of a bigger thing that we're going after at Pendulum, which is, which is to say that 
there are a lot of kind of one size fits all solutions out there for people with GI distress. And the truth is that many of us may have found a solution that works for us, but you might find that over time that thing stops working as well. And the reason for that is because your microbiome evolves, it changes over time. And so one of the things that we're very interested in at Pendulum is what is it about a person that makes a product work for them, for their gut microbiome, but then over time as they evolve, how do you evolve with them and bring them new functions to their microbiome that help them? And so um, we are actually uh, launching this program which allows you to take a diagnostic survey about what your GI symptoms are, and, and, and it's both kind of what you feel as well as behavior behavior and get a baseline on yourself and then get a formulation from us and understand how is that changing your gut microbiome as well as your symptoms and then if that product doesn't work for you bringing you a new product that has additional functions so that we can start to work with you to figure out what are the functions missing so that you're not just taking every probiotic under the sun but you're actually taking something that the minimum thing that you have to take in order to fulfill your microbiome and so I'm very interested about in, in this program and it's starts with Clostridium butyricum and the butyrate production. Well, that so, but what about my other favorite strain and your favorite strain, Acromancia? Where, where does that fit into this picture? Yes, it does fit into this program. So uh, as you're, you're pointing out, acromancy is a very, very important strain. And, and, and acromancy is really interesting too, because not only is it able to produce short chain fatty acids, um, and you know, lives, resides in the, in the mucin layer and, and helps with the, the mucin regulation, but in the genome of acromancia is the uh, enzyme that upregulates GABA production. And so one of the things that I think is very interesting about acromancia that's different from Clostridium butyricum is this potential gut-brain relationship and the production of GABA. And so when you think about these two strains, yes, they do have some common ground in terms of uh, being able to increase butyrate levels, but they are different in that, you know, acromancia doesn't directly generate butyrate, you know, it, it, it generates uh, other short chain fatty acids, um, and that they're kind of acting in two different roles. So this gets back to kind of like the fireman and the truck, you know, you really want to be able to figure out, are you just missing the fireman or do you need both the fireman and the truck? And so that's what this is really aimed at. So yes, uh, good point, acromancia is part of that program as well. So um, how, all right, so how do you get uh, Clostridium butyricium? Um, can I eat butter? No, it won't work, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, you, you, you probably have some Clostridium butyricum in your gut, much, much like we have all these other strains. And so what you're trying to do is to enhance the growth of it, or if you've become depleted in it, getting it back. And so, um, of course, at Pendulum, uh, we are really focused on how do you directly give your body the strain back. And so uh, we have figured out how to manufacture this strain. It's actually one of the hardest strains to manufacture because of where it resides in your gut. Um, there are no, there's no oxygen there. And so that requires us to manufacture this in a closed end-to-end -end system where no oxygen can get into the manufacturing of it. And that's one of the reasons why it's not available on the market today very readily and certainly not at the concentrations that we're putting it on the market at. And so um, we've been able to manufacture it, we've been able to demonstrate its viability, and we've been able to show that when people take the strain, you can see it show up in their gut microbiomes and their stool samples. And so the fastest way to get this strain is to take it directly, to take Clostridium butyricum, and then to make sure you've got the prebiotics that are continuing to feed it. And I'll bet you, you have a product that does just that. We do, we do. We um, have just launched actually today, I believe, on the website. I, I think last time when you and I spoke, it was right when we had launched Acromancia. So yep. somehow this timing is working out where you're catching us literally the day or the week that we're launching these products. So uh, today we launched a product that uh, has Clostridium butyricum. And so you can try that to see if you're able to seed your microbiome with Clostridium butyricum and to reap all of these health benefits that we've been discussing here today. Neat. So that's now uh, on your website, pen pendulumlife.com. Yes. 
PendulumLife.com. And I believe there's also, uh, if your listeners uh, want to go on and purchase it, there's a discount code that they can use uh, for specifically for your listeners. And I think it's Gundry, Gundry 20. Gundry 20, you're right. You're Gundry right. 20. Yeah. All right. Now, another one of your products, uh, which I'm a big fan of, and I, I, I make no mistake, I'm a big fan of their products. Uh, and we have no relationship other than the fact I'm a big fan. How's that? Uh, but glucose control. So what's the difference between the product you're just releasing, Butyricum, a Clostridium Butyricum, and glucose control? The, the Pendulum Glucose Control product has a, a formulation of five strains and the prebiotic that, that inulin that feeds those strains in it. And so it has different ingredients in it and it has the multi-step biochemical pathway required to metabolize fibrin to butyrate. And uh, it also contains acromancia in it. And it has been clinically shown to lower blood glucose spikes uh, as well as A1C. And so it was designed to help people metabolize sugars better and thus the name glucose control and um, has preclinical and clinical data to support that. Clostridium butyricum is really, really much more focused around uh, gut health than it is around metabolism of sugars. And the clinical trials that exist out there in the world today that have been done on Clostridium butyricum have been primarily focused on GI uh, symptoms as opposed to metabolism. And so if you are trying to improve the way your body metabolizes glucose and you want a product that has clinical data behind it for that and was designed for that, that's really pendulum glucose control. If you feel like you uh, are really targeting GI, then acromancia and clostridium butyricum, these would be the products that, that would be more targeted for you. Gotcha. You know, I have, I have a number of patients now uh, on on both of your products and uh, two of my patients, uh, uh, particularly we have the results after glucose control after three months and, and both of these patients, a husband and wife, uh, had really elevated, slightly elevated hemoglobin A1Cs, slightly elevated insulin levels and they, they're, they're not overweight, they're fit, uh, one's uh, literally a professional dancer, and yet had elevated blood sugar levels, had elevated hemoglobin A1Cs, and we've tried every trick. And I suggested they try glucose control, and they were they're, they're good, good experimenters, and they both had really impressive reductions in their hemoglobin A1Cs, their A1Cs for people who watch TV, and their uh, insulin levels. So. Um, that's my first, you know, two patients that I can actually report back on. But yeah, I think, uh, and you have, you know, human clinical data to, to prove that this is real. This wasn't just a placebo effect for them. And it certainly wasn't with my patients. Well, that's fantastic to hear. And I think, you know, that's really important, Dr. Gundry, for people to know that, you know, the different um, tools out there for them to use, as we all know, you know, diet and exercise, and then the variety of, of small molecule drugs that, that get prescribed to people for, uh, you know, even pre-diabetes and then certainly for type 2 diabetes. Um, really, the part that hasn't been studied or understood very well is the microbiome. And I know that you have been doing a lot of work to educate people on the what the microbiome is and what its role is. And so um, this is really pendulum glucose control is the only product, the only microbiome intervention out there, which was designed to help with the management of glucose and has the clinical data, the peer review published clinical data from a double blinded placebo controlled, you know, randomized trial. And so we, so our relationship is not just that you're a fan of Pendulum, but I am also a fan of yours and the education that you do to help people know and just have awareness that there's another tool that they can use out there that they probably haven't gotten a chance to try yet. Yeah, and you know, I, I hate to use the words, this is all natural, uh, but, but it is. You know, this is what you know, we should be doing to optimize this diversity of our microbiome and, you know, Kudos to you guys. I know you spent 10 years getting this accomplished uh, and a whole lot of investment and money because you're right. This is, 
this was the holy grail, really, of uh, probiotics, is how do you grow these guys? And we've had a previous podcast about that, and it's like, it's impossible to, to grow these guys, and you guys have done the impossible, so congratulations. Well, it's been very exciting. And, you know, for me, it's very personal because I started this this whole journey with having a, a my, my first daughter was born prematurely almost by two months. And when they're born that early, they get put on antibiotics in the, in the intensive care unit to prevent them from getting an infection. And what we know now is that infants and children who are systematically on antibiotics, which are decimating their microbiome, as they get older, they're really positioned with a depleted microbiome from the get-go. And as she got older into elementary school, she had real food sensitivities that the rest of us didn't have. And I've had her on pendulum glucose control since we invented it now for several years. And she, um, well, for better or for worse, she, the girl can now eat whatever she wants. And so <laughs> I myself have seen, you know, what, what it can do when you have a um, a supplement to your microbiome that that really is filling a gap and not not to say I mean I'm not anti on antibiotics they've saved millions of lives people should take them when they have a bacterial infection but there are repercussions to taking antibiotics and, and many people feel that even the antibiotic associated diarrhea and so thinking about how to replenish your microbiome after going on antibiotics I think is super important and, and that's part of what we're trying to understand and learn too so are there any other particularly powerful strains that listeners should know about? Well, um, I think, you know, right now, the strains that we've been very excited about and talking about, Acromancia, as well as Clostridium butyricum, um, there are some other strains that, that we've really focused on, uh, Bifidobacterium infantis. So B. infantis is another really important strain that's been studied from uh, really um, birth uh, th through aging as an important strain, and, and that's in our formulation as well. And then there's two other strains, Clostridium bejerinki, uh, as well as Anaerobacterium halai. And maybe someday we'll, we'll deep dive on those strains together too. But um, I think, and we have a lot of other strains that, that we're starting to learn about. I think the important thing to keep in mind is that um, none of these strains that reside in this part of the gut have really been manufactured at scale. And so that is a real breakthrough that we all have to figure out. And then making sure that these things are safe, they don't have virulence factors. There are bad bacteria, and so we want to make sure that we're, we're helping to keep those down. But the more that you can provide your microbiome with these good bugs, the less less chance that those bad bugs can do what C. diff does and start to propagate unchecked. And so thinking about what are all these good bacterial strains is something that, that we do a lot of. And we'll keep talking to you and, and having you bring the latest and greatest strains to your audience and your followers as we learn. All right. Yeah. And, and you know, I've, I've posted about this uh, the last time I went to Europe last fall. Uh, usually I take uh, several jars of my product, Lectin Shield. Uh, to tolerate the cheating that I do in France and Italy uh, with uh, poor food choices. Or, and they, they work very well. And when uh, I said, what the heck, I'm going to put Acromancia to the test. So I took your Acromancia with me and I left my lectin shield at home. Probably, looking back, was probably dumb. But uh, with just your Acromancia, uh, I really had no gut issues on a 10-day trip, and quite frankly, it would have torn my insides out if I, you know, if I hadn't had lectin shield to, to guard me. So this stuff, this stuff works, folks. Uh, I've seen it in my patients. I've seen it personally, and that's why I'm such a big fan of you. And, and everybody knows I, I don't recommend anything that I haven't tried and I haven't looked at the research. And again, kudos for you for going the distance for your daughter. And now you're helping all of us with this. So we, we thank you again. Thank you, too. And I think, you know, one of the things that um, is really hard for people to understand, you know, when they go into the, the, the grocery stores and, and convenience stores right now, they're just shelves and shelves of probiotics. And so how do people figure out, you know, what's the right thing for me? And, and I, I think a big part of what you do is to help educate people on how to make those selections. So I'm wondering if you, you know, when people, people must ask you this all the time, hey, doc, what probiotics should I be taking? You know, how do you think people should be looking at probiotics and, and what should they be looking for? 
Well, I think one of the big uh, misconceptions that maybe you can clear up, and I try to, the vast majority of, of probiotics, particularly in foods uh, like yogurt or even sauerkraut, never make it to their destinations. Uh, most of them are destroyed by stomach acid. Uh, you, you've got to have a system to prevent stomach acid degradation of these. Having said that, as I talk about in uh, the uh, Unlocking the Keto Code, there's very good work out of Stanford researchers that show that uh, fermented foods, which contain lots of prebiotic fiber, actually promote a more diverse gut microbiome and a less inflammatory response than just prebiotic fiber in and themselves. And I, have a th I think it is because of these short chain fatty acids that are in the fermented foods and not so much the probiotics that they contain. And so, you know, follow, follow the evidence, folks. Look at, you know, which strains have been tested. Make sure that it's not in a test tube. Um, as, I tell, as I say, what happens in a test tube oftentimes does not happen in a living body or particularly in a human being. Uh, so just be a wise consumer and that's why, you know, we do these programs so you get some information that you can use. All right, Colleen, I gotta let you go. Uh, again, it's great seeing you again. You've already told people pendulumlife.com and you can use the code GUNDRY20 on to get 20% off your first month uh, on a subscription base, correct? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on and having another fun discussion about uh, the latest and greatest in microbiome science. Yeah, so uh, yeah, these, these guys, it's, it's not silliness, it's not pseudoscience. Uh, these, these guys actually probably have far more importance to us than just about anything else. And so, uh, again, good work, and we'll look forward to hearing your next greatest and best stuff. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Have a great day. All right. Take care. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Dr. Gundry Podcast. Make sure to check out the next one here. What should a good poop look like? Well, there's no absolute definition of you having a perfectly looking poop. If you listen to my good friend, Dr. Terry Walls, you, when you have a bowel movement, you should look into the toilet and see a giant coiled snake looking back at you.